Today's case takes us to San Diego, California, where at 9.22pm on the 6th of November 2000, emergency services would receive a telephone call from 24-year-old Kristen Rossum, who found her husband, 26-year-old Gregory de Villers, lying unresponsive in bed. Kristen would be talked through CPR while she waited for an ambulance to arrive, but it would be to no avail. Upon taking Greg to hospital, he'd be pronounced dead around an hour later. What was initially portrayed as Greg tragically taking his own life quickly turned into something far more sinister, involving lies, infidelity and murder. Hello and welcome to the channel. Born on the 25th of October 1976, Kristen Rossum was born into a family of high reputation. Her father Ralph was a professor and former member of the Reagan administration, where he worked within the Department of Justice and was highly respected within the field of constitutional and juvenile law. Her mother, Constance, was a former high power advertisement executive. Given their status, it was only natural that Ralph and his wife Constance would impose high expectations upon their children. Kristen, being the eldest of three, perhaps felt this more than others. In a bid to get her daughter to stand out from the rest, Constance introduced Kristen to modelling and ballet from a young age. Kristen was particularly talented in regard to the latter, performing in several stage productions and even ousting a professional ballet dancer from their role in the Nutcracker. But her career in ballet would be cut short after tearing ligaments in her ankle and sustaining a stress fracture, forcing her to quit. The injury caused Kristen to slip into depression and by high school, she had begun to experiment in drink and drugs. Eventually, Kristen became addicted to methamphetamines. She would steal checks and use her parents' credit card without their knowledge to support her habit. Although Ralph and Constance would eventually learn of their daughter's substance abuse, leading to several arguments. These fights would occur often, and on occasion police became involved. Kristen had been arrested on one occasion, after her parents found drugs on her possession. She would enroll into the University of Redlands in 1994, hoping to start afresh. But her demons would resurface. Kristen would self-harm, and on one occasion, she had made a failed attempt at ending her own life. By 1995, Kristen was at rock bottom. She had dropped out of school and ran away from home. She would make her way to Tijuana, where on the public bridge crossing the US-Mexico border, she would meet the man she would go on to marry. Greg de Villers, who was 22 in 1995, saw Kristin while travelling to Tijuana with his brothers. He was immediately attracted to Kristin, and she would agree to spend the day with him. She would later agree to go back to his apartment with him. The pair entered into a whirlwind romance. She had effectively moved into Greg's home that he shared with his brother and friend. She opened up about her troubles with drugs, and Greg, who was staunchly against drugs, agreed to help her get clean. It wouldn't take long before items would go missing from Greg's home. Items such as family jewellery and checks belonging to Greg's brother, Jerome, had disappeared. Suspicions were firmly on Kristen, but she denied it vehemently. However, they would later be found in her purse. Jerome would move out soon after this breach of trust, but Greg would continue to stand by Kristen, who was still keen to help her get back on the straight and narrow. Greg was utterly obsessed with Kristen and was prepared to do all he could to make things work. For a time, things seemed well, as Kristen got clean and she had successfully enrolled into the San Diego State University, graduating summer cum laude in 1998. That same year, she was hired full time to work as a toxicologist at the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office, where she had previously been an intern. Greg saw a future with Kristen and proposed to her, to which she accepted. While Greg was excited at the prospect of marriage, Kristen wasn't sure of spending her life with Greg, telling her mother roughly a month before the wedding that she had doubts. 
Her mother simply put this down to nerves and convinced her to press ahead with the wedding. And so the pair married on the 5th of June 1999. Just months after tying the knot, Kristen was telling people that she felt suffocated in her relationship and that perhaps she had made a mistake. In truth, soon after joining the medical examiner's office, a new man had come into her life. Dr. Michael Robertson, a native Australian, began working at the medical examiner's office soon after Kristen went full time. Colleagues observed the pair openly flirting and sharing lunch breaks together, causing rumours to spread around the office. These rumours were not unfounded, as Kristen and Michael, who was also a married man at the time, began a passionate affair. By October 2000, Kristen had resumed her methamphetamine use and Robertson discovered traces of the drug in her desk. Part of her job was to log confiscated drugs into the medical office, giving her ample access. But rather than dismiss her, he decided to flush the drug down a toilet and cover for her. Greg was unaware of his wife's infidelity and resumption of meth use until the beginning of November. A couple of days before Greg died, Kristen's parents had visited for dinner. Ralph commented that on that night, Greg drank heavily and was loud. He also obsessed over roses that he bought for Kristen's birthday a few days earlier, commenting that all but one of the roses had shed its petals. The night before the 6th of November, Greg found a love letter that Michael Robertson had written to Kristen. An argument ensued, with Greg threatening to expose Kristen's affair with Robertson, as well as her drug abuse to her work. Kristen told investigators that on the day of Greg's death, she woke up to find him very groggy. She said that he was so out of it that she called Greg's place of work and left a voice message to let them know he wouldn't be in that day. Greg's boss attempted to contact him at around 10am and again just before midday, but there was no answer. At work, Kristen was seen speaking with Robertson in his office, looking visibly upset. She left at around midday to visit a Von store, where she bought some items and returned home to have lunch with Greg. Kristen said it was during this time that Greg admitted to her that he had taken a mixture of oxycodone and clonazepam. Kristen would later tell police that the drugs belonged to her, as these were purchased a couple of years prior, while she was attempting to get off the meth. After lunch, she returned to work, saying that Greg had gone back to bed. Kristen said she returned to work, but was seen leaving again at about 2.30pm. She saw Robertson again that afternoon before returning home at around 5pm. An hour and a half later, Kristen left home again to run some errands, before returning back between 8 and 8.30pm. She would then take what she called a long bath, kissing a sleeping Greg on the forehead. Afterwards, she got into bed and it was at this point that she noticed that Greg was cold to the touch. When paramedics arrived, they found Greg de Villas on the floor with rose petals all around his body, with a wedding photo on a pillow and pages from Kristen's diary, which revealed her plans to leave him. Rossum briefly told paramedics that Greg hadn't taken any drugs, but quickly changed her tune, telling them, the police and the hospital, that he had consumed oxycodone and clonazepam. She also explained to friends and police that the roses were a kind of message to her, signifying that their relationship was over. Initially, it appeared as though Greg, consumed with sadness at the prospect of losing his wife, couldn't continue to live on if she was not a part of it. It seemed as though he had ended things on his own terms, and this appeared to be the case when Greg was autopsied by the very medical examiner's office both Kristen and Michael Robertson worked at. They would find traces of oxycodone and clonazepam in his system, confirming what Kristen had said earlier. But as the days went by, questions would begin to be raised, which would ultimately change the direction of the investigation into a homicide case. For starters, Greg's family refused to accept that Greg had consumed drugs knowingly, given how anti-drugs he was. They were convinced of foul play, particularly Greg's brother Jerome. In fact, Jerome was so unconvinced that his brother couldn't have done this to himself, 
He secretly recorded conversations between Kristen and himself, hoping to find something incriminating. Additionally, he would constantly badger police to investigate further into Greg Davila's death, something which would eventually pay off. Police learned that the person responsible for handling Greg's autopsy was actually Michael Robertson. Understandably, this caused many an eyebrow to raise. Investigators also learned that Kristen had also agreed to donate Greg's skin and eyes mere hours after he had died. She had also arranged to have Greg cremated soon after his death. Worried about the obvious conflict of interest, police arranged for the remaining of Greg's samples to be sent to a private toxicologist in Los Angeles for more extensive testing. The results were intriguing. While oxycodone and clonazepam were again present in Greg's samples, Los Angeles toxicologists also found something else. 57 nanograms of fentanyl, which is seven times the normal amount needed to kill a man. If you're wondering why such a high amount of fentanyl wasn't picked up by the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office, well, the answer's pretty simple. Fentanyl isn't a drug which is commonly prescribed, and so many medical examiner's offices don't test for this. As it so happens, the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office is one of those. The presence of fentanyl raised further questions. Given the amount found in his system, it would take a much smaller amount required to immobilise Greg in a short amount of time. Why then did Kristen tell officers that he was groggy for much of the day? Not only this, but fluid was found in Greg's lungs, which suggested that he would have been unconscious for what they estimate to be between 6 and 12 hours. And so if that was the case, how did he end up dead in a bed of roses that he supposedly made as some kind of final dramatic statement to his wife? She would say it was an homage to her favourite movie, American Beauty, but police were less than convinced. What was even more interesting was that searches of Kristen and Greg's flat turned up no fentanyl container. Naturally, questions would be raised as to how high levels of fentanyl were in his system, with no container in sight. And then there's the night in question. When Kristen made the 911 call, emergency services only took three minutes to arrive. The operator would guide Kristen through CPR while she waited, but upon their arrival, they found her in another room. They noted that Kristen didn't appear as though she was tired from performing CPR, and no redness was detected on the chest of Greg, which is typical to see when chest compressions have been carried out. And not only this, but the 911 call was listened to, and it didn't sound as though Kristen was actively performing CPR. At the hospital that night, one of the investigators initially on the scene stated that a man arrived to see Kristen, and witnesses stated that the couple were seen sharing a passionate embrace. They would soon learn that the man was Michael Robertson. Police now wanted to look at both Kristen and Michael more closely. Once they discovered Kristen's previous drug habit, they decided to carry out an audit at the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office. They searched through the logs of confiscated contraband and learned that of all the drugs obtained, some were missing. Unsurprisingly, these were oxycodone, clonazepam, methamphetamines and fentanyl. Robertson would later admit that he knew that Kristen had stolen drugs from the office, finding traces in her desk as I mentioned earlier. However, he decided not to say anything to his superiors, opting to protect her instead. Following these revelations, both Kristen and Michael Robertson were fired from their positions a month after Greg's death. Police would also seize computers known to have been used by both Rossum and Robertson. These were searched thoroughly with a fine-tooth comb, and what they found was rather interesting. They found hundreds of email communications between the pair, expressing their feelings towards one another. But this wasn't it. Examinations on Michael Robertson's computer revealed files concerning fentanyl. While this on its own isn't unusual for someone working in a medical examiner's office, this wasn't a usual situation. What raised eyebrows even further was that police discovered that shortly before Greg's death, both Robertson and Rossum were sent to a presentation about fentanyl 
paid for by the medical examiner's office. The presentation discussed the dangers of fentanyl and other key facts about the drug. They were given separate rooms, but police discovered that Robertson paid for another room for the couple to share. And finally, earlier I briefly mentioned about the roses that Greg apparently bought for Christine for her birthday. According to her, the rose petals found near Greg were supposed to have been from one of the few surviving ones. However, police had made a fascinating discovery when looking into her purchases on the day Greg died. When she visited the Von store that day, she paid with cash. Now, usually without a receipt or CCTV footage, it would be almost impossible to trace what she had purchased. But Kristen made one critical mistake. She used a Von store card to obtain a discount. These store cards record each individual item purchased, and when police checked her transaction history, they learned among the items bought, a single red rose was paid for on the 6th of November 2000, the very day Greg died. In May 2001, Michael Robertson returned to Australia to look after his sick mother. While he was under investigation, no charges had been brought against him at that point of time. But as for Kristen, she would be arrested on the 25th of June, over seven months since Greg had died. She had been charged with the first degree murder of Greg de Villers. Bail was set at a staggering $1.25 million and she would spend roughly six months in prison while her parents worked to raise funds to post her bail. They would eventually remortgage their home and she'd be released on bail in January 2002 as a result. While waiting for her trial to begin, Kristen would continue to protest her innocence to the media, sticking firm to the story that Greg had ended his own life in a dramatic manner. This line of argument was one the defence used at her trial. But on the 13th of November 2002, she was found guilty of the first degree murder of Greg de Villers, and in December that same year, she was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. After Michael Robertson returned to Australia to look after his dying mother in 2001, he remained in Australia, where he remarried and continues to work as a forensic toxicology consultant. In 2013, an article was released revealing that in 2006, a warrant was issued for his arrest by US authorities and a 100,000 bail set should he return to the United States. Suffice it to say, he hasn't touched US soil since leaving. It was reported that in 2014, Michael Robertson gave evidence as a key witness in the trial of Gerard Baden Clay, who was convicted of murdering his wife, Alison, in 2012. It was not mentioned to the jury in that trial that he was named as an unindicted co-conspirator regarding the Greg de Villa's murder. Michael has always maintained his innocence. As for Kristen, the de Villa's family would sue her for wrongful death in 2006 and be awarded $100 million, although this would later be reduced down to $10 million, plus a $4.5 million compensatory award, which was unchanged from the original decision. The San Diego Medical Examiner's Office were also told to pay $1.5 million to the de Villa's family. Kristen made numerous attempts to appeal her conviction, and in 2010, a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that her defence should have challenged the forensic tests carried out by the prosecution by requesting that they carry out their own, which they failed to do. An order was submitted to look into whether this failing by her defence could have affected her trial. But by 2011, the Court of Appeals withdrew its opinion, instead replacing it with a one-paragraph statement they cited that under a new US Supreme Court precedent, her petition was denied. To this day, Kristen resides at the Central California Women's Facility in Chochilla. Like Michael, she continues to deny any wrongdoing. Thank you for watching. If you found this case informative, please consider hitting the like button and sharing this story with anyone you know who shares an interest in true crime content. If you want to support what I do further, you can subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss an upload.
you may also wish to consider supporting me on Patreon or by becoming a channel member, where you'll receive exclusive content and shout outs at the end of each video. Speaking of which, a special thank you to my current channel members Needle and Fur, The Alabastard, Mr. Gently Benevolent, Amanda, and Krista Lands. Thank you for supporting the channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye for now.